Hello and welcome to Kinshasa, a dirty, congested, polluted city in West Africa that has all the stereotypes and none of the positives. Yellow car. There's not much of note in Kinshasa. One of the few things is the 20th of May Stadium, which is where George Foreman and Muhammad Ali had their rumble in the jungle in the 1970s, but there's not much jungle here. Yep. Yellow car, yellow car, yellow car, yellow car. Traffic is unbelievable here. Yellow car, you know, you know. So this is a statue of Lauren Desiree Kabila. And he's as good a person to start the discussion around the colonialism in Congo. Out of all of the colonial histories in Africa, the colonial history of Congo has to be probably amongst the worst. And the post-colonial history isn't any better. So Congo, Democratic Republic of Congo, was colonized by the Belgians. Well, not really by the Belgians. It was a personal possession of King Leopold. And King Leopold was the worst of the worst of the worst of the colonizers. He enslaved, he murdered, he brutalized, and he took it all in for his own personal possessions. So bad was King Leopold that the Belgians fall over themselves to apologize for what he did. And there is finally even a museum now in Brussels commemorating the evil deeds of King Leopold. But just because your own racial group takes power doesn't mean it gets any better. When the Belgians were finally kicked out, a interim local president came in who was then kicked out in a military coup by one Mobutu Sese Seko. He changed the name of the country to Zaire. And Mobutu Sese Seko was just as bad, and just as brutal and just as horrible as King Leopold and pumped billions of dollars into his private accounts in Switzerland. He was then overthrown by this guy, Lauren Kabila, backed by the Rwandans, and he changed the name back to Democratic Republic of Congo. Part of the deal he had with the Rwandans is he would close the refugee camps on the Congo-Rwanda border, where inter ahamwe militias were continuing genocidal attacks across the border. I know that because I was there. Now, Lauren Kabila reneged on the promises. So the Rwandans invaded, ultimately had him killed, and replaced him with Joseph Kabila, Laurent's son. And Joseph Kabila spent his whole time snorting cocaine and doing nothing for the local people in Congo either. What that then allowed was a small window of opportunity where a couple of mid-level bureaucrats decided, hey, let's improve the quality of life for some of our kids. So education rates slowly started to go up, particularly in the East of Congo, particularly for women and children. On paper, Congo has an amazing potential. It's a huge country with many natural resources vast difference in climactic ranges, beautiful jungles and rivers, natural forests, most of which are now being beaten up to feed our desire to clean the environment in Western countries. And nothing speaks white Western privilege more than the degradation of the environment here in Congo in the name of protecting the environment in wealthy countries. I'm about to go on a rant. And as we started to decarbonize Western economies, demand for cotan, cobalt, and other rare earth minerals went through the roof, and they come from here. And whilst I agree climate change is real, and whilst I agree we've got to do something about climate change, surely we can do something about climate change without increasing the human rights abuses of people here in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Now, 14-year-old girls five, six years ago, were going to school in Eastern Congo. But now, with a massive increase in demand in rare earth mineral, they're being pulled out of school and forced to mine things like cobalt on $2 a day. And the vision that you're seeing here, I've taken from France 24, these are the conditions that these people work in for $2 a day. Now, you might say, oh, well, it's worth it for climate change. Well, when a 14-year-old girl gets raped going to a mine to dig your metals for your batteries on your electric car on $2 a day, and then has to carry the baby that she has as a result of that rape, and you don't advocate for climate change free of human rights abuses, particularly some people I know who have given all the information about human rights abuses because of greening the planet, and they still refuse to demand 
for human rights free violations. They'll still talk about green cars, but they won't talk about the red cars dripping with the blood of the children who mine rare earth minerals in this country. Because leaders of this country, whether it be the indigenous leaders or the former colonizers, none of them have ever given a shit about the people at the bottom of the pyramid. The only people that could are the consumers who ultimately buy the products coming from the rare earth minerals. They could demand a clean supply chain, but they choose not to. And I call that the height of white privileged hypocrisy. So this is my guy. Mm. He's from Katanga in Congo. Kisangani. 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 Mm. Okay. So tell me, what's your view of mining and education and children? In Kisangani. Mm. In Kisangani, uh, many children don't like to study. When well, they, 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 they have some information, but uh, every children get money to the, the mine carrier, and uh, they stop studying, they go to the, the carrier to, 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 look, to look for money. And that's Kisangani. So what do you think about people in rich Western countries who say, drive a car, have an electric car, and let the children in Congo mine the rare earth minerals? What do you say to them? Because uh, it's just good. We yes, you have an electric car, you have some some money, but uh, as a future, no education is not good for uh, the, for the future of a country. Uh, it's not good for the future for the country no. if you have a generation of children mm. who choose to go to mine rare earth minerals mm. instead of getting education. Yes, yes. So choose very carefully when you drive an electric car. Ask the manufacturer, how do you know that your rare earth minerals come that are clear of human rights abuses? How do you know your minerals are not mined by children? How do you know that your demand for a clean energy future isn't destroying the future of the Democratic Republic of Congo by robbing from its children the ability to go to school? That's the question you should ask BMW or Volkswagen or Audi or anywhere you buy your electric car. How do you know it is human rights abuse free? And just like a lot of places in Africa, there are places for wealthy people as well as the poor. To enter this water park will cost the average Congolese around about the same as 10 days of work for a 14 year old girl in a mine in Katanga. 10 days work, one day water slide. While I'm pretty negative about DRC and Kinshasa, there are some parts like sitting here on the river overlooking Congo Brazzaville, another international border, and this is a part of the river where, well, the border is uncertain. There is potential in this country if it had good governance, which it hasn't, never has, and there's no hope of it getting it really. And without sounding like a broken record, the current activities to fight climate change in the West are doing monumental harm to this country because it's siphoning huge amounts of money into government coffers so they can continue to ignore the plight of the people. If only those fighting for climate change amelioration would also fight for human rights protections in Congo, perhaps we could kill two birds with one stone, beat climate change and ensure better human rights protections in places like Congo. But at the moment, our fight in the rich world against climate change is causing immeasurable, long-term, multi-generational harm to poor people in Africa. And that's nothing new for white people. So on that note, I'll say goodbye, Democratic Republic of Congo, and head across the river to Brazzaville.